Welcome everyone to the latest webinar from Medicus IT. Today, we are speaking about Mind the Gap, keeping your healthcare technology decisions on course. So if this sounds familiar or our speakers found, sound familiar, it's because this is backed by popular demand. A few months ago, we did the part one of this webinar and it was received very well. So this is part two of a strategic conversation where Medicus IT is bringing in three industry experts to continue the conversation and dive deeper into why it is so important for organizations to stay aligned in a constantly changing environment. So to understand what Mind the Gap means and why it's critical to approach technology from a new perspective. In today's session, you'll learn how to develop a plan that encourages business enablement and ultimately drives transformation. So whether you find your practice experiencing an ever evolving crisis, unplanned events like the pandemic we all went through or even changing regulations, hopefully with this discussion, we'll give you some insight on how to tr transform IT in a shifting competitive landscape. How do you stay ahead and stay profitable? And hopefully our speakers today will help share how to bring value to your market and keep your decisions on course. So before I announce and take you through to meet our amazing speakers, we have a poll for you that I would love if you could all answer to help make sure we're speaking to your needs. So the poll question should have popped up on your screen here in Zoom. Just so you know, there are five questions so you can scroll. So the first one is, have you ever experienced technology as a bottleneck in your business? Yes or no? No in-between options. So if anyone says no, I am going to be very curious. <laughs> Number two, um, has your business experienced the impact of the great resignation? Do you guys all see this poll coming up here? Yeah. All right, so guys, start putting in your answers. Thank you. All right, number three, how confident are you that your organiz organization is leveraged technology to stay ahead? <clears throat> so are you guys leveraging technology to stay ahead in the future? This is anonymous, so you don't you can be truthful. Um, and then of course, just a couple of quick questions for us so we can better help serve you in the future is how did you find out about this webinar? And what is your occupation? Who are you? So we can make sure to make this content as relevant for you as possible. So a lot of you are being shy. Please come join this, these poll questions. You don't have to answer. Um, well, it is anonymous. So we would love your answers. <laughs> so hopefully a couple more of you can get it in while we have some elevator music here that I cannot sing. All right, last 10 seconds to get in your answers. All right, I'm going to share the results and then I will announce our speakers and they will speak to all of this content throughout the presentation. So it seems like, yes, most of you are having te experiencing technology bottlenecks. Yes, almost all of us have experienced the great resignation. But many of you are actually fairly confident that your organization is levering, leveraging technology to stay ahead. So that's great. I'm curious how, you're, how you will feel after hearing our thoughts about it today. And we are so glad that many of you are back from a previous webinar. So hopefully a lot of you heard part one and, um, and this will be even better. So let's get to meet our speakers. Our first speaker is, drum roll. Michael L. Caton. Michael is the chief information officer at a community medical center, and he's a very performance-driven CIO. He has a proven record of success leading strategic initiatives and teams of technical implementers to drive process improvements, increase competitive advantages, and generate business impacting results on key community health initiatives. He's a skilled business analyst, and as CIO of a community health center up in Stockton, he really, he drives all the technology initiatives supporting over 1,000 employees, 100 million in revenue, and 30 plus clinical locations that are caring for more than 100,000 patient lives. So thank you for joining us, Michael. All right, next we have Laird Smay. I hope I said your last name right. <laughs> and Laird is a technology advisor at Geo Sales Consulting. 
Laird is a 40 year veteran of technology utilization. So he has seen technology through many different phases through our modern day here. Um, and he has seen its impact on organizations. He's worked with some of the largest technology companies in the world and he constantly delivers measurable results for his clients. And in order to do so, it has required him to have a very um, amazing deep understanding of the technology and the services being utilized and their impact on the diverse landscape and underlying cultures of each specific market. So thank you Laird for joining us and last but certainly not least we are very excited to have our very own Tim Hebert here who is our Chief Revenue Officer at Medicus. He is a lifetime entrepreneur, innovator, and adventurer. He's been a business owner for over two decades. And before joining us, he ran the IT services for Atrion, which is a 160 million, 200 plus employee organization. And he also founded Trillix, which is a business consulting and app development firm. He held the position of chief managed service officers at Carousel Industries. So Tim also just released a book on leadership titled The Intentional Leader. So it's available on Amazon and I actually just started reading it myself and it's great. And so he speaks a lot on these topics of intentional leadership, culture and change. And we are very excited to have him today to bring his expertise to this, organ to this webinar. So without further ado, Tim, I will pass this over to you and we're really excited to hear this conversation. Well, thank you for the great introductions. You know, so this is a quick question to my friends, Michael and Laird. Did it feel like you're being introduced for the dating game that show from the 70s? <laughs> Just a little bit. <laughs> Just a little bit, yes, exactly. Well, guys, I'm glad, I'm glad that we're back and able to continue the conversation. We had a fantastic conversation um, back in the month, month of March where we started introducing this idea that organizations have to really track what the, what's happening in the industry. And there are many drivers that were causing us to respond and react um, that's out there. Some of them we're well aware of them, some that you know are more passive. But just to take a kind of a, a, a look back at what we talked about, we kind of looked at this, this uh, model here that talked about how the pace of change is accelerating as time is going on. I think if we look at our businesses as every day goes by, the things that are happening are happening at a faster and faster pace, which means we have to respond faster. And when we look at this, there's a number of industry drivers that are happening that are changing on an ongoing basis. We have no control over those. They're gonna happen regardless of what we wanna do. Um, those drivers sometimes fall into kind of what we call five, five major buckets. The first one focused on what are the expectations of the market? What do our customers want? What do our patients want? Um, what are, you know, you know where, where, um, where is the business going to go in the, in the future? The second element that we have is landscape. Our competitors shape what we do. Our competitors may open up new offices. They may change their business models. They may be able to lower the cost of delivery of their service. We've all seen stories of the video store that we used to go to that was on the corner being replaced and non-existent with us now watching streaming movies on TV on demand, wherever we happen to be. So we see those kind of changes where our competitors are changing the, the skate landscape that we're in. Either we compete and we keep pace with them or we fall behind and eventually you know, cease to exist. We talked about crisis events. We just recently experienced this with COVID um, and we've had you know hurricanes and you know, we have civil unrest, all kinds of other crisis moments that causes our business models to change. We have the ever increasing security threat landscape. Um, just when you think you've seen the worst of it, it seems there's the next one comes out and it's even worse than the last one. Um, and we have to respond to those. Um, then the last area we talk about is regulatory changes. You know, our governments are changing rules, regulations. We have to be compliant. How do we keep pace with that? The compliance standards are becoming more rigorous and more they demand more of our time and attention. So how do we respond? So as these drivers change in the ideal world, as they start to change, we've already met them, we've already planned for them and we're able to implement them. And as we look at that teal line that's on the screen today, we would follow and track that line perfectly, but that's not the case. There, when we are trying to implement these changes at key pass, we're always out of sync to some level where the drivers are. And what happens is the orange line represents our response to those initiatives, to those changes. Sometimes we're on track and we track perfectly with the line that industry is going at. Sometimes we'll lag behind that and we drift. 
that gap between the blue line and the orange line is really the gap that we talk about. This is where we look at organizations being able to keep pace with change or not. The bigger this gap becomes, the more critical it becomes for our business to become more aligned with where industry is going. The bigger gap, the bigger the gap is, the less responsiveness we are to what's happening around us. So I want to stop here for a second, and I just want to, you know, you know, bring this back to uh, Laird a little bit. We talked about this last time um, quite a bit. So I just like to kind of get your opinion from what you've seen. You've worked with a lot of organizations, a lot of organizations in healthcare specifically on all signs, ambulatory care, community health, hospitals, urgent care. Um, do you feel that this gap is staying pretty narrow and you know status quo? Do you think it's growing? What do you think is happening within the healthcare industry with the gap? Uh, Ted, thanks. Uh, what I'm seeing, <clears throat> and again, just from a sample audience that I've looked at and spoke to, I've actually seen the gap get wider. Mm. And what's interesting is the gap got wider, not because the practice didn't invest in the technology. They actually did. But unfortunately, they didn't complete the investment. So for example, if I had, I had old expectations that I would, you know, let's talk about expectations of the market. As a patient, I had my old expectations of my practitioner. And then suddenly they've invested in new technology. They did it with the right reason. They wanted me, they wanted to address my new expectations, expectations that I brought into this market from my experience to help in transportation or, or you know, finance, whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. But they didn't complete the deal. They bought the technology, but they failed to recognize that it, transformation is not about simply changing technology, but you're also affecting processes and people. Mm. And so what's happened is that gap got wider because now you're no longer meeting my old expectations and you're not meeting my new expectations. And so that gap got wider with regard to that driver. Another thing has happened is as while they were doing that and we're dealing with the crisis event of COVID, well, COVID accelerated some of these transformations. Mm. Investments were being made there. But unfortunately, with those investments, then we created, we created a new threat. The threat landscape has gotten bigger. Yep. So not only is the gap getting wider because these drivers are, are accelerating, but the gap is getting wider because we're failing to implement technology properly. We're mm -hmm. failing to take into account, it's not just about buying technology and turning it on, but it's about the transformation of the processes and, and involving the people, which include not just the, the, people, the practice personnel, but actually the patients. Mm -hmm. And so, our, their own efforts have created an even wider gap. And so that's, I see a lot of frustration there right now. Yeah, you know, it's amazing that you say that because what I'm hearing and what I've seen as well is that it's not about not investing in technologies. We're finding businesses and organizations, many of the people on this call are making the investments, is that they're not able to, to bring it to fruition, to bring out the, the full potential of that technology. One of my favorite business books is a book called Good to Great. And in good to great, they talk about how do the organizations make this transition from being good to being a remarkable organization that's able to deliver the, the promise of, of what they can offer to, the, to, their, to their market. What, we, what, we, what, what they talk about in that book that I really you know, resonate with me, it's not using technology for the sake of putting technology in place. It's about using technology to accelerate the business. So it can't be a singular technology discussion. It's more robust than that. And one of the things I took away from this, it's really about how do we lead change versus how do we invest in technology kind of conversation. So Michael, I know that you've been involved with leading change in your organization for quite a while. So, so what do you think that has to shift to be able to make sure we're, we're closing this gap? Um, so what, what's your thoughts? Well, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that there are a number of things that organizations can and should do when they're giving consideration to to technology implementation, right? I mean, it goes beyond the, the kind of nuts and bolts kinds of things that responsible organizations do when they're putting together their criteria for requests for information and they ultimately move to the RFP uh, phase of technology acquisition. Uh, but you've got to identify, accurately identify all of the key stakeholders, mm -hmm. right? And all of your key stakeholders are not always within, you know, the confines, the walls, the construct of your specific business, um, particularly in healthcare uh, and kind of piggybacking off of what Laird said earlier, you have to deal with, um, you have to deal with the patient 
And you have to get the patient's perspective and get a level of understanding of what the true patient need is, because that will actually help you to shape mm -hmm. your technology acquisition strategy and will, and will kind of automatically force a narrowing of your uh, acquisition efforts, because there's only certain types of technologies that are going to meet you know, a specific group of needs that you're trying to address. You know, it's interesting because um, in my introduction that Risa did for us, she, she mentioned I'm a serial entrepreneur. I started, start, I started 22 companies. My companies that have been most successful are the ones that I designed, I would say backwards from the way most organizations work. Most organizations start with an idea that wherever they are in their business world at this point in time, and they design the solution out to the client. And what I've tried to do in one of the ones that have been most successful, start with the client and work backwards, right? Kind of, you know, kind of follow it backwards, which often reminds me of a, you know, a, a tenant I took away from one of Stephen Covey's book on leadership, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, where he talks about, um, you know, it, it's about kind of starting with the end in mind and working backwards from there. And so one of the things I, I, I think we want to look at here is as we, realize that that gap and that leadership that we need to do needs to be closed. Um, where, do, where do we, where do we, you know, how do we get started with this and where, where do we take it? So in the case where I'm hearing, Michael, what you're saying is that we need to kind of look at the end in mind, work backwards, identify stakeholders, under, understand how do we actually meet them where they're at? And then how do we build that bridge to them? So how do, you, how do you do this in the real world? Because you got fire drills you're putting out every day. You have competing demands and priorities that are grabbing your attention. So how do you actually make that happen in, in a business world real time? Well, for me, <clears throat> it shows up in a series of, guess what? Meetings with key stakeholders, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so for me, in, in our organization, you know, there are multiple layers of management as there are in most organizations. Uh, and I target a lot of my efforts around uh, communicating with uh, our extended leadership team. These are the people that are closer to our clinicians. They uh, mm -hmm. have more uh, input, impact, and observability of the day-to-day -day operational uh, focus and cadence. And so I have a series of meetings with them, standing meetings that I have with them, mm -hmm. just to do intake, right? Just to do intake, things that they don't get an opportunity to share with my techs, that are out servicing them because oftentimes that's break fix kind of work unless it's project implementation type work. Uh, and so I have, a, I have a series of, of, of meetings. The other way that we um, uh, try to facilitate that information intake and gathering is through governance, technology mm -hmm. governance, um, where you have a standard way of ingestion for uh, new tools and technologies that you want to consider for investment. And then there are parameters placed around um, uh, that ingestion process or that governance process that provides some, some guidance and some, some guardrails, for lack of a better term. And then uh, between, you know, my standing meetings and the technology oversight governance, you get some idea of the needs of various stakeholders within the business. You get an idea of what they're thinking about and what technologies that they're seeing, because let's face it, there's no way that a person in my role um, can know about all of the technologies that could be brought to bear in a specific vertical within your business. And so by using those mechanisms, you basically have a, a filtration function by way of the governance, uh, but you also have a set of legs, eyes and ears that are tied to the business. Yeah. And now you've got that, you've got that um, a connection, uh, that bridge, so that you've got bi-directional communication and now you can help to shape the ideas and the overall technology portfolio because I'm having meetings with all of my stakeholders, Yeah. right? And yeah, so, so now really I, get, is, I get an umbrella view. So it really sounds like for you, where you focus is making sure you have the right stakeholders, you're having the right conversations with to be able to take that information you're hearing from them and build that into your strategy that helps you prioritize what you're trying to do. Did I catch, capture that correctly? Captured it spot on, Tim, spot on. Perfect. So, so you know, what's interesting about the, the time that we're in today, I think we're in a, a, a point in time where there's going to be a tremendous sea change happening within healthcare. It kind of reminds me of almost back in the late 90s with the internet. 
I, you know, we have gray hair, so most of us can remember kind of back what it was like in 97, 98, 99, when the, the promise of the internet was really starting to burst forward, right? And people, you know, businesses were starting overnight trying to, you know, capture that. You know, you'd see the Super Bowl commercials and they had all these startup companies that were selling furniture or, you know, um, insurances or cars or whatever it happened to be. And everyone's going to be a billionaire overnight. But what happened with that change, there's was so much change that happened. It fundamentally changed the way we work as a society, right? The fact that we have cell phones that we can order something from Amazon and two hours later is in our hand, right? We've changed that model. So, so later, I'm going to go back to you a little bit here on this is that if we look at this and we think there's a tremendous amount of opportunity and we want to be able to, you know, be able to kind of meet that opportunity like we did back in the early, you know, late 1990s and early 2000s. How do we do that now? How do we actually, you know, put a stake in the ground and start moving towards the future of healthcare? Well, I think we have to get our head out of healthcare for a while. Okay. We, we think of, you know, we, I think the, the challenge is, well, we're healthcare, we're different. And mm -hmm. we, we look at it just in perspective of healthcare. I think we need to step out of healthcare for a while for a moment and look at other industries, who's really accelerated and done very well in those industries. You look at mm -hmm. you look at Amazon, for example, in the retail space, you look in, in finance, you know, what we're seeing going on in finance to other markets. They're successful because they're addressing critical needs, they're, they're, they're addressing expectations of the market at large. Mm -hmm. And so if we look at how they're addressing the expectations of the market at large, can we also do that in healthcare? You know, so, you know, I think of, you know, again, Amazon, they've created this expectation. Now, if I want to order something, I can probably get it today or tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and, and that's affected other retailers in the space. Some have gone out of business because they can't even respond and they can't get close to it. But it's also created expectations in finance. It's, in, it's creating expectations in healthcare. And so if we do that as a healthcare provider, we can look at ways to actually gain a competitive advantage in the marketplace to really truly differentiate ourselves because the bar can be quite low. Mm. Right now, everybody's scrambling with how do we do this? How do we do that? How do we meet these, these, these expectations? But there's if, to really just shine in just a few of these areas, I think a practice can really stick out. That you know, the, the patient community goes, wow. They brag about it, I, and I have experienced myself where I, I now tell people, you need to go to this particular practice. And I'm telling you right now, these guys get it. Yeah. And, and so that requires us to look at the market more broadly, look at what expectations are, and then adapt to those. It's interesting you say that. I, I recently had a schedule, recently about a month and a half ago, a doctor's appointment, and it took me two months to get my appointment. So from the time I talk to them to the time I get the appointment, two months is going to go by. I now have a business travel that's going to conflict with that appointment. So I call to say, can I reschedule it? It's now two months from that time for my next appointment if I choose to travel for business. We live in a day and age where I expect to be able to download a song immediately or play a song immediately on my iPhone. I live in an age where I can place an order with Amazon. I get it within two hours, right? We are living in this world where demand, what we want, it's fulfilled in, in ridiculous amounts of short time. Yet we have a healthcare system that's still kind of giving long, long lead times. Now, once again, there's no simple answer and there's no singular answer to that. Amazon wasn't able to deliver products in, in two hours overnight, but they, they, they were working with an end in mind eventually to be able to deliver that product almost instantaneously anywhere in the world to anyone at any time, right? So, so as we start thinking about healthcare, how can we change that? Michael, one of the things I noticed that you that know that you and I talked about a little while ago is this idea that the way we look at healthcare is changing. You know, from the fact that we have an eye watch that can keep track of some vitals of ours, our heart rate, our blood pressure, our blood oxygen saturation level, all those kind of things. There's devices coming on the market now where for relatively low price, someone can be at home, connected to these devices and actually provide real telemetry information to my primary care physician or my specialist I'm seeing. And how, do, how does an organization like yours prepare to, of that change that's happening with the technology that's gonna drive how we deliver healthcare going forward? Well, I like to preface my response with starting with the end in mind, right? What does healthcare in the future look like? Healthcare in the future looks like, and you will hear this from the larger um, uh, 
medical providers. You'll hear it from the Kaiser Permanentes and the, the Humana Healths and those kinds of things. Um, less investment in large medical hotels, mm -hmm. i.e. a hospital. Yeah. <laughs> More investment in very targeted, smaller, but a, a high concentration of, of preventative primary care access related types of, of facilities. And within those facilities, there is some kind of a telehealth model, right? Either a telephone conversation with your provider or a video conversation with your provider, leveraging remote patient monitoring technologies heart monitors, blood oxygen monitors. And I expect that there are other technologies that are coming down mm. the pipe. Um, as an example, and as an aside, uh, for the individuals who um, combat diabetes and they have to check their blood, there was a time they actually had to stick a full needle into their, into their arm, extract, get it to the lab and wait for the results. Mm. Now they have a little pen. I remember the late B.B. King was a spokesperson for it sticks his thumb, gets his reading right away, knows what he, in that case, what he was supposed to do relative to managing his condition. We're going to continue to see more, more uh, technologies like that as we combat this issue around access, right? So you start with the end in mind. How do we remove the barriers, particularly in the community health space around access, right? Well, remote, remote patient monitoring is one avenue mm -hmm. that will expand greatly and help with that but there's also back-end um, benefits of those kinds of technologies as well. Because you take, um, you take a person whose job was to enter, manually enter that information. Well, with remote patient monitoring systems, that stuff can go directly into the patient's chart, directly into the EHR. And then when they do have to come in or there's a transition of care, they have to go to the hospital, they move to another, uh, another medical uh, services provider, um, mm -hmm. that information is readily available. So it's those kinds of things. And so you have to figure out what is the goal. And that goes back to your point of starting with the end in mind. You know, it's interesting as you're talking to that and you mentioned diabetes, right? You know, one of the challenges I think that we face as a society is that we, we're good at, the, at fixing the problem and treating the symptoms in the moment. Um, but many times we're not good at how do we actually happen after we're sitting in the doctor's office, everything is good, but then we leave what happens in that. And it sounds like too, with this technology is happening, the way we treat chronic care could change drastically to where instead of just being when I'm in the doctor, I'm getting treatment, but I'm being treated across the board. My blood, my, my, my blood sugars are being measured all the time. I can take my smartphone and see where I'm at. That information is sent to my doctor, right? There's alerts that go off if it gets to certain conditions and maybe there's a more proactive Kind of measure that takes place um so starting the end in mind we could not only solve one or two problems but we could solve the bigger healthcare problem how do we create better wellness across all this be more right. preventative more focused on what we do instead of the kind of reactive kind of treatments that we are dealing with now nowadays you so know, being, pro being proactive is, is crucial yeah. uh, and these kinds of technologies allow you to do that because the idea is to keep people from going to the emergency room that's right Right. Yeah, the convention yeah, but, does that. And it's less expensive for society as a whole. Oh. So there's a whole plethora of benefits. Larry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. You know, I was thinking of one of the things that struck me because the other day we were talking about this monitoring devices. That's a good start, but it doesn't complete the journey. Because if I happen to have a device that monitors my situation, whether it be heart, diabetes, whatever the case may be, it just gives me an indication. But then I have to go to the phone. And I have to go through the frustration of making a phone call, being on hold for long. It takes two months to get the appointment. We didn't complete the journey. We didn't hit the expectations. Mm -hmm. So as to connect these things together, that everybody is involved, just so they, they see the real benefit ultimately by completing the journey. And that's what I see most often in the deployment of technology. They just do a piece of the journey. Mm -hmm. They didn't complete the journey. And so it, it fails. People say, I'm yeah. not going to do that anymore because it doesn't work. Yeah. Great point, Larry. It, it, and technology gets a bad rap, IT gets a bad rap, when it's really kind of, we didn't understand the full the full journey that needed to be undertaken as we're doing this. So if the these gaps get-, get 91% of the people sort of looked at the survey results to begin the session, 91% says to, to, to experience tech as a bottleneck. 
that just that just proves it right then and there. They saw yeah. tech as the bottleneck. It, tech was not the bottleneck. They didn't complete the journey. They didn't complete the journey. So, so this gap that we have, was, we're not starting with the end in mind. So we have these journeys that are incomplete. You know, kind of what do, the way the way we look at this, and I think a lot of times is where, where do we start? And I think when we think about this, there's, it made me think about this Chinese proverb that says, you know, when's the best time to plant a tree? And the answer is it was 20 years ago. And, the, you know, and that makes you think for a second. Some of the stuff that we're talking about now, we should have already started three years ago, five years ago, building out this journey, putting the pieces in place to make it happen. We may or may not have done that at this point in time. If we haven't done it, hope isn't lost, right? We can make up ground. But the problem is we have to start thinking about it now. And I think that's really the message we need to have here is that we need to start thinking with the end in mind now understanding that complete journey, understanding that it's more than just technology, it's about the complete change initiative that we're, that we're leading and doing to be able to create the outcomes that we want going forward. The, um, I want to kind of bring up another point that I think is really interesting. And, and we, we had a conversation the other day, and we, as we were talking about this, um, I think Michael said, made a comment about, you know, in his world is that patients come second. And I just want to explore that comment, Michael, and just kind of, you know, get to what you were thinking about. Because I think this is an important tenant as we move forward um, in our planning session. Certainly. <clears throat> well, first of all, the, um, the, the thought comes from uh, a partial title of a book, if not the complete title, where it says the patients come second. And the idea there is that in order to provide quality service, in this case, quality care, mm. you've got to take care of your employee base your technologists, your providers, your back office support people, the people that never touch the patient, but mm -hmm. support all of the people that do. That entire ecosystem has to be well taken care of, well maintained, well fed. That means you have to take care of the employees, right? And so that means a series of conversations and interactions, substantive interactions, where it's a no blame environment, where it is an environment where you're saying, hey, I'm really here to listen. And I need you to give mm. me all of the information, no matter how ugly it is, without fear of repercussion that somebody's ego will get in the way you know, <laughs> on the receiving end and want to take it personal. It's not personal. No. These people that we are responsible for supporting by way of business enablement through the use of technology need to have solid partners, but they also need to be able to have a communication stream a bi-directional communication stream where they know that they're being listened to and that their needs are met so that they can provide the best possible care to the patients. Take yeah. care of the employees, the employees take care of the patients, the patients take care, take better care of themselves, the bottom line takes care of itself. Yeah, you know, I think, I think you're hitting on a great point here. And I think, you know, it's easy to take talent that works in our, that work in all levels of our organization for granted, right? We, it's a necessary, we need to have the doctors, we need to have the nurses, we need to have to have the administrators, we need to have the staff to, to execute this. But what we've noticed in the last couple of years, a lot's changed, right? The culture of organizations changed because now we're more virtual than we've ever been. We've had, we've seen a great resignation come, right? Where people are, are making career changes, quitting their jobs, looking more that work-life balance or work-life integration in a, in a different way. Um, and it's having an impact on our ability to kind of use technology. And as you mentioned, people are a big part of that to really change the nature of this. I know that in the work that you do, um, Laird, you spend a lot of time with helping prepare organizations for that change and people specifically. Um, so what do you see, you know, when we talk about this patient comes second and putting the focus on employees, what would you add to this conversation? Well, I think that, I mean, it's, it's, I think it's a, really valid point that needs to be focused on because the the employees they play such a major role in the success of your practice and, and with the experience of the patients and if they don't have the tools they need or even know how to use those tools or even how to use how to explain those tools to the patient it's going to fall down flat mm. You know, a perfect example, I've had a physician's visit recently where I got this notification from the portal when I was there at the office and I was talking to the, the nurse there. I said, so what does this mean? She said, I don't know. I've never seen that. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like you, are you kidding me? She says, no, I don't use that. I'm going, okay, well, then, then why'd you put it in? And so we got to equip the, the staff mm -hmm. with skill sets and the capability and the access to these things. And I think if we do that, they'll be far more 
um, and more zeal when it comes to helping the patients understand it and use it. And I think it, it comes through very vitally. I mean, we see this right now with in the, uh, in the airline industry, transportation industry, unhappy employees. It's having this massive impact on the, on their, on their customer base. Oh, absolutely. So, same thing you have here. I'm in Atlanta right now and it took me three days to get here. And I saw that frustration from my side personally, as well as from the people around me. And quite frankly, the technology was zero help in most of these cases. So, so I can imagine that. You know, a while back, I had a friend of mine that shared a story. He was with his granddaughter. His granddaughter was about two and a half, three years of age. And um, they're standing in their, their kitchen area and there's a sliding glass door that looks out into the backyard from the kitchen area. And um, the, the grandfather points out to his granddaughter that there's a bird sitting out in the lawn. And so the granddaughter goes up to the door and she's looking out the door and she basically does this with her fingers, like to try to magnify it like you do on your phone or your iPad, right? And you know, I, I share this story because I think it's kind of interesting is that when we look at our talent, the more accessible we make the technology and how that technology is used with the organization, I think the less stress and frustration that our employees have, the longer they're going to be more engaged, the longer they stay with the organization. Um, when we make it more complicated, where it's not as simple that a three-year-old can do or a two-year-old can do, the more challenging it is, the more hoops they have to go through, the more constraints we put around it, the harder it is for them to be successful in their jobs, they get frustrated. Right. When I, you know, you're looking at the airline industries like we're talking about now, there's a lot of frustration there. It's just not working the way it needs to be able to work. They can't answer my questions when I'm asking them, when's the next flight to get to where I need to go? And they can't answer that question. It's frustrating for them. And then they start making choices about where they want to work or not work um, as they go forward. So it has a huge impact. So as we were talking about this, one of the things that we talked about is that Many times when we're a technologist or organizations looking at using technologies, we have the singular focus on technology. And I think that what we, what we talked about is that we have to change that mindset. You know, we can start with starting with the end in mind. We start putting our focus on our employees and making sure they're taken care of so they can take care of our clients. But really what we want to do is we want to be able to what we call triangulate on success. And when we talked about this, we said we have three basically three entities that have to come together in this classic Venn diagram environment. So, so Michael, when we were talking about this, um, you, you brought up some interesting points about bringing the patients and employees and the organization itself together. Um, could you share a couple of those thoughts with us? Sure. Um, <clears throat> as I think about it, you know, certainly here at community medical centers, uh, one of the things that I've tried to do is, you know, engage the employee base uh, and open the transparency or improve the transparency of decisions around technology acquisition mm -hmm. uh, and implementation. Um, and so what that what that did is that brought, you know, that brought some more knowledge to me to inform mm -hmm. uh, the conversations I would have with potential vendors. Uh, but it also it also uh, indirectly provided me with a view or a window into what the impacts, potential impacts could be on the patients. The other thing that it illuminated was the need to really be an active and somewhat aggressive change agent pleasantly uh, to the extent that you can uh, to bring all of these together and then to find that nexus that's shown here on the diagram where the three intersect, right? And once you're able to move the organization the employees and the patients into that space. Now, you know, to use an, an old cliche, you're cooking with gas um, <laughs> at that point, right? And so um, uh, that means um, a lot more emphasis on interpersonal communication, telephone calls, face-to-face mm -hmm. um, -face meetings, you know, the water cooler conversations that don't happen as often because not as many people are in the building yeah. at the water cooler. But um, you can still have those kinds of substantive conversations, but you've got to bring the three of them into very close communication and contact, and then be able to distill rapidly what the need is from each one of those constituencies, figure out where your inflection points are, and then exploit those, um, those, those points of inflection to the benefit of everyone that's involved 
um, and is shown in, the, in this Venn diagram. Yeah. So, so, so just Laird, kind of thinking about this from a perspective, I think that when we look at it, there has to be some kind of parity or balance between these three entities, right? If I, if I put too much emphasis on the patient side only or the employee side only or the organization only, this becomes out of balance. Right? It does, and it doesn't work. It doesn't achieve that kind of that perfect spot that's in the middle, right? That that you know, where all three of these circles intersect. How how have you seen that balance, you know, be challenged within within the way we think about technology and and uh, transformation? Well, I think that I think we have to change our focus. If our focus is entirely on technology, then it will we will we'll over rotate into one area only. It, and so you know, this this whole triangulation, we have to be curious, curious enough about each audience here, what does success look like for you? Mm. I think of, I think of as when we were talking the other day, you mentioned some, some practice, maybe as a physician you're going to, they're still using paper records. And I made a comment to you, I'd be willing to bet if you talk to their patients, they would rave about that practice. They would say, these guys are great. They take the time with me because their focus has been on the patient community. And of course, the practice is going to suffer because they don't have electronic records. So it takes real discipline to not over rotate in one area or the other. And that discipline comes from a broader view. You can't be just so laser focused on the technology alone, because quite frankly, most of the sellers of technology, they're selling efficiency. And the problem with efficiency is efficiency is doing things right, but effectiveness is doing the right things. And so what happens is most of the organizations focus so much on putting technology to be efficient. Mm. Well, they're good at what they're doing, but they're not doing the right things. Yeah. But instead, look at it, what's the most effective way? What's the right thing to do? And how does technology serve that? And that will allow us to get closer to center. We'll never be an exact center, but it allows us to stay much closer to that center than the other way around. Yeah, and you know, you know, you, as you were telling, you know, talking about that effectiveness and um, analogy that you use or story that you use, it reminded me of a story. So, as I mentioned the last time we talked, my wife was diagnosed with um, pancreatic cancer a year ago, January, and she passed away a year ago, April. And there was a moment before she went into hospice where we had to rush her to the emergency room. And because of COVID and COVID protocols and all the things that needed to take place at the organizational level of the hospital. Um, I wasn't able to be with her through critical times um, during this portion. They re-ran every single test that she had done, you know, blood work and scat scans and all kinds of stuff. Um, I'm out in my car waiting to be to get any update. But I have this application that they gave me that I can log in to look at the results of the lab work. So I'm in the car and for about five or six weeks, I've been looking at these lab results nonstop. You know, they, they've showed us and taught us what markers we should be looking at where improvements are being made, where improvements aren't being made. So I'm in my car, it's about nine o'clock at night. I'm looking at the application and I'm looking at the, the seven major markers that, she, that, she, that we've been looking at for five or six weeks. Every single one of them looked normal. And for the first time ever, they're normal. I had one that was just outside of normal a little bit. I'm sitting in, this, in my car at nine o'clock at night thinking to myself, oh my God, this chemo and all this stuff is working. My wife is gonna get more time. So now what happens is I can't see my wife. I can't talk to a doctor. I go home. I'm in a great mood. Next morning I get up. I'm trying to get in touch with anyone. I can't talk to anyone. I don't finally talk to a doctor until 4.30 that after the following evening. 4.30, the message they give me is that my wife is dying. She has weeks to live and she needs to be placed in hospice now. Now think about this, how this was completely kind of out of, out of sync. I was getting real-time information that was fantastic, but I had no context to that information. Right. I had no way to process. So I processed it the way that was, that was important and meaningful to me, but it was out of sync with what, the, what my wife needed, what the hospital and the, the treatment center that she was at was, was providing. And the employees were in no position to help me with this entire process. It was all completely disconnected. It was out of balance over-rotated. The technology was fantastic. It worked exactly as advertised, but didn't give the result that we wanted. So it made it very, very challenging. Um, and that's what we have to stop that, kind of be able to build that. What's the better model? If I start with the end in mind, if someone's going to look at this results and there's a question, who do they talk to? Right. 
right? That's a big part of this whole process. So it just can't be the technology conversation that we've been, we've been talking about. So I want to be mindful of time. Um, this has been a great conversation. We could go on for days, I think. <laughs> Every time we have you know, planning sessions for this, we talk ad, ad nauseum about things. But um, what I want to do is do a real quick recap here. And um, Laird and, and, and Michael, anything you want to add at any point in time, just feel free to jump in. So really what we want to talk about is about mining that gap, right? We want to be able to understand where industry is going. We don't want to be blind to that. We don't want to ignore what's happening. So we got to be mindful about what's happening in the industry. We got to make smart decisions about how we want to meet the demands of what's happening in that. But we also have to make sure the gap is not widening too much. There will always be some level of gap. We can always correct it by moving in sooner or later at, at time as needed. But just investing in technology to close that gap is not enough. What we really have to do is focusing on what does the end journey look like? What's that? You know, we want to start with the end in mind, understand the complete journey, and work our way backward to build a solution. Um, and like, like we said earlier, too, I mean, if you're out of alignment, the gap is getting wide. It's not a matter of that we can't get back in the game. It's just, we just have to start now. We have to put the stake in the ground and say we need to do X, Y, Z and move and do things differently. Uh, it's amazing how much ground you, you can cover when you have to. Think about when COVID hit and we couldn't work in the office anymore, how quickly most of us shifted to a remote environment. And it was almost, for most organizations, almost seamless. I know, Michael, we talked about this last time, how seamless it was. And you even saw productivity gain in doing that process. So being able to take that action now is really a key element um, as you recognize the gap is widening. Um, I also think that the, another tenant that we have to look at in this journey is, is, is not to be technologists, right? It's easy to get stuck in the technology. It's easy to get you know, excited about the efficiencies that we can gain, all those kind of, those kind of elements. But what we really need to understand is if we want to be successful, we have to really start with our employees and making that technology accessible to our employees so that they could actually drive the innovation that we need, drive the transformation we, we want. And consequently, if they're able to do that, then they're able to lead our clients through, our patients through that, that change and transformation as well. And the last area that I, I think we want to kind of just nail down is that it's about triangulating success. And what that really means is that we're not an independent entity that's working in a silo. We got to bring all the stakeholders together, focus them, and focus on the intersection where the organization, the employees, and the patients come together. Anything you guys want to add to kind of the recap? I'd like to weigh in just a little bit more on the, uh, how we triangulate success and weighing in by use of an analogy, uh, the analogy of a car, mm. right? Um, you know, there is a reason that it's a V8, a V6, a V4, <laughs> a V10, a V12. Um, and, and, and the whole premise there is that it's balanced, mm. right? There's X number of cylinders on each side. Right, even though there was one five cylinder. It's like six, right? <laughs> right. Yeah. We won't get but, into that one. Bro. Right, right. Yeah. But the idea is that with that balance and that precision engineering, right, uh, as long as all of the underlying components are well taken care of, the wires that connect to the spark plugs, et cetera, et cetera, the vehicle will generally run pretty well. The moment that the wiring is not right, or one of the spark plugs is a fouled, even though the engine is still in balance by design, but it's not firing in balance. Mm -hmm. And now you have other problems. So you want to make sure that in order to triangulate the success, that you look at all of the underlying systems that support that V dash, whatever it is, in order for it to stay in good operating condition to allow you to safely, and in some cases, very speedily get from point A to point B. You know, it reminds me of when I was early in my career of being a business owner, I was complaining to a very wise friend of mine about the business where I was at. And his response to me was, he goes, your business is working exactly the way you designed it. <laughs> <laughs> so that's exactly it. So I'm going to turn it back to our, our, our friendly moderator to take us home here. Great. Thank you so much. This was an amazing conversation. I want to have a little bit of time for Q&A. So if we could get to the next slides. I just want to tee up our next webinar so you guys all can have it on your radar.
which I think is the next slide. Perfect. So this one's called the great retention. Doesn't that sound better than the great resignation? Yeah. It does. So how IT transformation can actually impact top talent and patient experience. August 3rd, same time, 12.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time or 9.30 a.m. Pacific Time. So mark your calendars. And then the next slide, if you want to take a screenshot, is just a few ways to connect with us. If you know, we would love to continue having this conversation with you. We can also connect you with Laird or Michael. Um, so now that you guys had a moment to do that, I'm going to take down the screen so we can see our lovely speakers a little bit larger. And this is the best time for questions. So if anyone has any questions, this is your last chance. Pop them in. Otherwise, um, have a couple questions ready to go. So first question. Um, which I guess might be talked a little bit more about in our next webinar, but it's still a good one. Um, how can technology impact employee retention? Mm. Michael, I'll, let's go. I'll tackle it uh, <laughs> because we're having, we're having those conversations within our organization now. <clears throat> um, having the technologies that people have grown accustomed to or have had exposure prior to coming to your organization and being aligned with kind of those market leading technologies is always going to be a benefit to your organization. So for us, uh, as you can imagine, so many of uh, our providers come from Epic shops, right? Epic, the, the, the EHR um, market leader, right? So having those kinds of technologies and other technologies that are recognizable by brand names uh, slash name uh, are also going to be helpful. But the other thing is, including those uh, employees that are interested in conversations about technology, getting their perspectives in terms of what could be leveraged and what could be utilized. Um, you never lose anything by including them in those conversations and being active and aggressive in seeking out their input uh, to help the organization shape um, an appropriate response. Well, Michael, what I'll add to that too, I think you, you hit on a good point is meeting people where they're at with the right technology at that point in time, right? I, I think what's happening in the workplace today, there's a huge shift in the, the who's coming into the workplace today. We have a younger generation that grew up with technology. It's that three-year-old that was met at the you know, sliding glass door that's doing this, that's accustomed to using an iPad at the age of three, right? You know, it's my grandkids that are downloading applications to an iPhone when they're three years old. Um, they are born using technology. When they come into an organization, we're using outdated technology and processes that are outdated. We're not going to be able to retain them the way they're at. They're going to go to organizations that are going to be able to kind of provide them the experience that they're accustomed to experiencing. So, so that's a big part of it is giving the technology where we're at. You know, it's funny the other day I was watching on, a, I was going on the train from the gates of the airport to the, the hotel I was staying at. And I'm watching a person on the train texting. They're texting with two fingers in their phone faster than I can type on my keyboard. You know, so that's just the difference in the generations. You know, I grew up in a generation where, you know, typing on a keyboard wasn't an essential skill for everybody. Yet now when people type faster with two fingers, you know, their two thumbs than I can. Uh, so, we got to meet the people where they're at. So I think that's a great point. Yeah. I think what and we I, need to look at also is how the technology will enable them to have greater flexibility with regard to the hours they work and where they need to work from. Uh, if you're locking them down, you got to be here from eight to five and that's it, you can't go anywhere. You're not going to hire anybody. Yeah. I love that. So this is great. And if you're interested in hearing more about this, make sure to come to our next webinar. So before we um, end today, last question is, what do you think should be the next step for the people that have tuned in today? We heard a lot of great information. What's their first step to put some of what you taught them into action? I'll jump out there on this. I would say, <clears throat> go and poll your employee base. Put together a quick little survey. You can do it with SurveyMonkey or some other tool if you have an internal tool. And put together not more than a 10 question survey how do you feel about our technology? What technologies are we lacking? Uh, are there any policies that are impede, or that you feel are impeding your ability to do your best work? And then take all of that information, go through it, and then adjust accordingly. You will be amazed 
at the quality of the ideas and the depth and thought of uh, um, related to the discourse that your employee base can bring to you. And that will very much help you uh, to better engage your employee base and you drive better solutions when you have diversity of thought and mm -hmm. input. Yeah, I, I think that's a great point. I think it's really about assessing that gap. Where's, where's the gap? And I think that part of it is, you know, you can you know, do the surveys, like Michael said, I think that's a really key portion to get the input. Um, I also think that what we have to look at is really trying to understand where we see healthcare being in two years, three years, four years down, and understanding where we're at right now today and understanding that gap. That's really, I think, a key element. So it starts with understanding the gap in my, from my perspective. I think too that your decisions too often today, technology decisions are made in the context of the, today's requirements only. And as a result of that, we'll end up buying a product. Yeah. We need to look, decisions need to be made in a broader context. They need to be made in the context that things will be different tomorrow and down the road. What will give me the greatest flexibility and the agility to respond to these things? And that's, that, that's where a big failure happens. We, if we make a massive investment in something that addresses today's problems, Next week, something else happens. Now, what do I do? Yeah. I got to sweat this asset and I still can't keep up. Excellent point, Laird. Um, a, lot of, a lot of my time is spent looking into the future, yeah. right? And then discussing those discoveries with the employee base um, and sometimes not people in the leadership team, but people that are much further down the food chain, but are most of the time more greatly impacted by the technological changes. Yeah, Michael, you know, we, a couple of the companies I, that I've run and started in the past, we, we implemented Lean as a mechanism for continuous improvement. And what I love about the Lean model, it's giving the employees a set of tools that allows them to create incremental change on the fly because they're in a position to know what's the best for them at that point in time. As long as the greater construct that we're trying to create is maintained, having them to make those micro adjustments really is key. And I think having that conversation and getting down to the frontline people, the people that are not necessarily always in the, you know, the executive leadership roles, I think makes a world of difference. And it's the same way going out to your patients, understand what your patients are looking for is key. You know, so I love it. Yeah, great answers. Thank you so much. And I think those are all easy action items that hopefully everyone on this call can start to work to implement. And I really thank Michael, Laird, and Tim for their time and expertise and sharing all this great knowledge with us today. This is a very am amazing conversation to be, have, to be having. If anyone has any further questions, you're welcome to reach out to Medicus. This is what we do all day long. We love having these um, strategic high-level conversations to help you take your technology to the next level. So much more than just a traditional IT company. So please reach out. And if nothing else, we look forward to seeing you on LinkedIn. We wish you a happy holiday weekend. And please join us for our next webinar when we're going to take this into the great retention world. So thank you so much again. Thanks, Bye. everyone. Bye. Have a great day. Bye-bye.